Oh, good morning, good morning. Oh, it's, it's nearly afternoon, it's half past ten. I normally get this video out by half past ten. I've just seen something quite unusual. A horse-drawn hearse. Four big old black horses at the front. Three, uh, three cars behind. And I think another hearse at the back. So, someone's pushed the boat out. Oh, what a day. Why would I want to listen to that? That's Mrs. Angry, that is. She's got the car programmed to go straight into blasting music as soon as, uh, as, soon as the ignition comes on. No, I had an exhausting day yesterday. I had, <laughs> I had a lady come in. We got her down for two bridges, right? And the reception said, oh, Mrs. Sertel coming in, but she's, she's given us a ring. She doesn't want her two bridges done. She just wants one bridge done. So I've uh, cancelled, I've sort of uh, cut her appointment length down a bit to an hour. So I'm like, okay, really? I mean, first of all, I don't, I very rarely do two bridges. <laughs> Secondly, if the patient says they want one bridge, that does not mean I can do it in 30 minutes. So I've got an hour to do a four unit bridge, upper right, 7654, five being a post crown, so I need to do a post prep and a post impression. And then uh, somebody else told me that she would quite like a temporary bridge because she's got a denture and you know, would like to throw it away as soon as possible. But you, you can't take, you can't do a temporary bridge by taking an impression over the top of a denture because the dentures very rarely touch the teeth. So when you come to do your injection molded temporary bridge, all the teeth fall apart because they're all separate. So I suppose you could, uh, I don't know, smear something in the gaps and take a mold over the top of that, but then it's still wrong on the inside, isn't it? You've still got the denture palette to contend with. Far better to do two nice temporaries and then, um, uh, oh my God, this is just, Now I've, now I've got a track here. On the very, very worst bend of the entire journey, someone's doing hedge trimming. And I've done hedge trimming. That reminds me. My new hedge trimmer arrived yesterday. There we are. You can see around the corner, so he told me to go around. Yeah, my new hedge trimmer arrived yesterday. Husqvarna, like Husqvarna, got a Husqvarna chainsaw. Very nice, very reliable, pretty good, you know. But uh, now, um, decided to go with the Husqvarna hedge trimmer. And hedge trimmers have come a long way, I tell you, from the old days. Like My old hedge trimmer I must have been 30 years old and it was just two blades one of which was fixed and the other one had like a, a slot in it and, and you had like an eccentric eccentric uh, a swivel joint that just used to go up and down and make it go make, make it go up and down. It probably wasn't any use for cutting grass, let alone a, a hawthorn hedge. So now I've got this this thing, Monster, three, nearly 385 quid it was, but I've decided that the only way to have a really, really neat property is to spend money on some decent equipment, some decent contracts, contractors' equipment. You, know, you have to have the plant plant hire level of equipment. So I've got a I've got a lawn mower that will mow almost any lawn, however high, wet or dry. Still not a ride on one though. Don't mean to think I'm extravagant. Just an ordinary. And a, I've got a chainsaw, petrol power chainsaw, which is for use when things get really tough. And, uh, and now I've got this hedge trimmer, which is just unbelievably murderous. And, and not heavy, but obviously if you're lifting it up, putting it down, lifting it up, putting it down, because they recommend you cut a hedge upwards, right? 
So you, you, don't, you don't start at the top and just pull down because in the, the mere act of pulling down distorts the head. It pulls everything down so that when you, when you end up with a cut, it, you end up with a wavy cut instead of a nice straight cut. So to get a straight cut on a hedge, you have to cut, start at the bottom and lift up because then what's happening is, is as you lift it, it cuts. But it does mean that you've got the weight of the hedge on you the whole time. So now you're lifting up the, the edge trimmer, you're, uh, you're lifting up the hedge. So anyway, my arms were dropping off after about 20 minutes. So what I did was I just let that bloody thing dangle and uh, ended up edge trimming the chunk out of my leg. But that wasn't even the main event yesterday. Yesterday, my wife sent me a text and said that the marquee, which we put up for the barbecue, and which I was really impressed with, had decided to turn itself into a kite, despite it being pegged down at all four corners and every bit of the edge pegged down as well, and uh, just goes sailing off across the field. So that's all bent up and, you know when you're, <laughs> you know when you're sort of staying in a seaside hotel and you've got a lovely view of the sea, and then in the morning you wake up and you can't see anything because a 15 storey hotel has parked itself up against the dock and so you know all you can see is this big white side of a liner well well but even if you don't I mean if you don't just try and imagine it okay just work with me on this and uh, that's what it was like I just came home and instead of seeing through my lovely gate into my lovely garden I could see through my lovely gate this upside down marquee which of course is all bent, isn't it? It's all bent. So, it's a bloody nightmare. So I'm gonna have to get a, some new bits and then I'll see if I can get them over from Germany before the end of next week. What a nightmare. So, anyway, so I've done this four unit bridge in an hour, or actually an hour and a half, because I said to myself, this is ridiculous. You just go to tell the next patient I'm running half an hour late because there's no way I can do a four unit bridge to the required standard packing it all with rust stitch in cord and everything in, in, in and out so um, so I'm already stressed and then fortunately the hedge trimmer arrived but then they said they were going to swap it over because they sent me one that was broken so it was supposed to be a swap so now I've got two a broken one and a good one and then the marquee decided to go sailing so, and thunderstorms were predicted last night, which finally arrived at three o'clock in the morning. So I, I just wanted to go home and sit down last night, but I didn't, I had to go home, check the hedge trimmer was working and disassemble a marquee. All, all with the wind getting up because there's a thunderstorm on the way. If that is, life is like that though. I think you, just when you think you can't give any more, you have to give more. And the good thing is that you always have got more to give. That's my homily for the day. And those of you who've got children will know this. Just when you think that you're gonna murder the children and yourself, you find reserves. <laughs> you don't do it, do you? Because you just don't think you can be pushed any further and then the kids will push you further. Whether it's just trying to kill you by keeping you awake or uh, you know, <laughs> telling you that you're, um, why have you got a fat stomach? Or um, going to school and telling the teacher that you chase them around with a stick. Well, and I'm failing to mention that it's a fun thing that you both laugh at and you're not really chasing them around with a stick. And, uh, you know, or just uh, saying that they're going to stay out till 10 and then staying out till 3. So, but you, you know, if you're a parent, you'll, you'll be familiar with it. You, you, you won't worry about being pushed. You'll think to yourself, no, I've got reserves. I've got reserves. And your reserves have got reserves as well, haven't they? So, I remember coming home from holiday once and uh, uh, we were been in Canada for three weeks and uh, there'd been a tremendous uh, raining, rains and floods and everything in the UK while we were in Canada. And a lot of people who lived close to the, it was a, it was a year that everyone who lived close to a river got flooded. I don't know if you there was all sorts of uh, flooding. It was, a, it was a few years ago now. It must be 20 years ago. And uh, I got home and we were absolutely exhausted. I had the kids in tow and I um, put the key in the front door and I said to my wife, Do you, "Can I hear, can you hear water?" Because we'd said 
you know, we don't have to worry about flooding. We live up a hill. Thank God we don't have to worry about flooding because we're, you know, Noah, Noah would be building his ark by the time the water got up the hill to where we were. But um, no, I said, can you hear water running? She said, yes, we can. And we came in and we had literally a waterfall coming down the stairs. The water was literally coming down the stairs like a waterfall because we'd had a pipe burst in the loft. It was in the winter. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and it, 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 I mean, it only been going for two or three days because we'd actually turned the water off while we'd been away and our cleaner had come in and turned the water back on again for us. Well, actually, uh, I think what had happened was we turned the heating off. That was our, no, was our mistake, obviously. We turned the heating off because we didn't want to heat the house in the winter for three weeks that we weren't going to be there. And she'd come in and turn the heating on about two days before we were due back to get the house heated up again. And of course, that's when the pipe, which had burst because it had frozen, then thawed out, and and we just got water literally coming from the from the loft, through the floor, th through the ceiling, you know, on the first floor, through the bedrooms, <laughs> and then down the stairs, and also through the ceiling and into the lounge, and you know, by, or even down onto the dining room table. Uh, if you leave the old, it was mains water, you see, it wasn't like it was a, was it, or was it from the tank? Anyway, the tank, whether it was the tank or not, the point was, I think it was, you know, it was, it was the cold mains, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like the tank. Well, anyway, it was a lot of water. So there was I, just back from Canada, just about ready to sort of not even unpack, but just put the cases somewhere and just jump into bed and go to sleep, because we were completely jet lagged as well don't forget because the time zone change and everything and then all of a sudden I have to find the tool kit the plumbing tools and, and enough energy to go up into the loft find a leak and disconnect it so and at that time our cold water stopcock was in the loft so and I tell you what if you are short of energy a really really refreshing dousing with the uh, stone cold tap water straight from the mains that's been running for two or three days does actually perk you up it does it's the sort of spritz that you need to give you the energy to stop the house falling down <laughs> I honestly didn't think i'd have the energy to do that and i did so uh, and so that's that, those are the reserves i summoned up yesterday when i had to do the marquee but anyway i was going to talk about implants today but i don't know whether my, uh, my marquee story has been so interesting, I don't really know whether I need to supplement it with anything about implants, or more accurately, whether what I need to say about implants can be said in the time that uh, I've got left before I get to work, but um, I think it probably can, because it's a simple point, and that is that I, we, we have an implantologist working for us, and uh, there is some scope for me to do implants at the practice. It was an implant practice, basically, that I bought. And I've been thinking long and hard for over a year over whether or not to train to do implants at my, you know, tender age of 58. And there's no doubt at all that I could do it. I mean, it's, I mean, basically it's a piece of cake, to be quite honest. But it's that attitude, it's my attitude that implants are a piece of cake, which is the problem. <laughs> because there were too many dentists who couldn't really do implants thinking that implants were a piece of cake and make causing permanent numbness of the various nerves in the jaw that um, that caused the uh, GDC and the Royal College of Surgeons to come down with a, with absolutely ridiculous uh, requirement training requirement for implants which in my case would mean I mean the only course reasonable course I've got near me is in Watford which is probably two hours driving either way and means that uh, and it's once a week, which means that I would, it's not the time off work I'm worried about, it's just the fact that they say that, you know, the first sort of seven weeks are really just going over the anatomy of the head and skull. And really once, you know, you've done, after two months, then they might think about letting you bring a patient along and putting an implant in. And I just cannot, I cannot be doing with this, I just cannot be doing with this. And the reason, my objection is not against training. I'm not saying that people shouldn't be brilliantly trained to do implants. I'm just saying that, you know, there's an awful lot of what they're teaching is 
undergraduate level anatomy and designed just to flesh out the course. Now why would they need to flesh out the course, right? The answer is that the GDC has historically jumped, jumped on people who have in any way failed to place the perfect implant from a great height. And that's a great, that's a shame. Because they are 20 years behind the curve on this. And the reason, I'll explain that as well, the reason why they are is because uh, when I qualified in the 80s, the only way that you had to assess any sort of implant case was um, an OPG. And it was quite literally a two-dimensional representation and you used to put ball bearings in, take measurements off it and try and interpret it in a sage manner and plan your implants and everything. And, um, and then when it came to putting them in the mouth, there was a degree of uncertainty about what was actually going on. Um, and the GDC and the Royal College of Surgeons requirements were drawn up in that environment and to a certain extent still think that they're functioning in that environment. Whereas in fact the implant environment now is very much different. Now what happens is you get a, a three-dimensional scan of the patient's skull and the actual implant placement is done with CAD CAM. You put the implants in on your 3D model. That's the insertion phase. The actual, when the patient comes in and the actual physical implants are placed in the physical bone, is just the insertion phase. That's not, you know, so that itself is a very, very simple technical challenge, which is just to, you know, manage the patient, get them numb, and, and, and sort of bang the old implants in according to this meticulously prepared plan. And as a result, it's, it's a far, far simpler job than it ever was. It really is, you know, providing that you're a little bit good with the CAD CAM, what you could do is you could, for example, you could, you could commission a scan, place the implants uh, in three dimensions, and then save that file and send that off to an implantologist and say, look, what do you think? Do you want to tweak it at all? Do you, am I along the right lines here? Let the implantologist say no I think you, you know your angulation is quite a little bit wrong on that or I would move this millimeter forward left right whatever and then um, you know after you've had perhaps your first couple of um, placements supervised I think that as I say the placement itself the actual thing that they're so scared of the thing that you know where is he going to put the implant straight into the ID canal that sort of thing is now not as scary as it used to be it's actually pretty durable by most half competent dentists but you still if you want to um, <laughs> if you want to place implants you still have to go through this ridiculous training which is all based on 2d OPGs and uh, you know, and I'm 58 and I'm hoping to retire at 65 I mean so basically I've got seven years left and what they're telling me is I've got to spend one of those seven years training to do implants so I can spend I'm gonna spend like 15% of my career training to do implants, my remaining career. So I, I just don't think I'll do it. What I need is a sensible implant training course. But sense, sense and sensibility are not synonymous with the dental profession. You know, someone, someone, if there's anyone watching or listening, please help. <laughs> I am stuck in the 1970s. <laughs> I need a nice implant training course that will get me placing implants without uh, without having to spend the rest of my life being treated like some pimply graduate. Or I just won't do them. Or I just won't do them. I don't, you know, to be quite honest with you, I am um, the money's good. And it's going to get better because fewer and fewer people, I think, are going to get trained to do it. Because uh, they're not going to be trained to do it at university. So, so it's a problem. Okay. That's it. Sorry. So mostly marquee and not much implants today. Oh. But I did have a late start, so that makes up for the fact that I was... I needed to have a bit of a slow start to make up for yesterday's stressful carry-on. Oh. 
I've got a reversing camera on this car, I can't always forget. Lovely, nice to talk to you, see you tomorrow, bye.